Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Rolf Jacobson. All right, here we are on the 14th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on August 29, 2021. And our first reading is Deuteronomy chapter 4, 1 through 2 and 6 through 9. The uh, semi-continuous reading is Song of Solomon. Woo, chapter 2, 8 through 13. Psalm 15 is the psalm. The second reading begins our time in James, chapter 1, 17 through 27. And we're back in Mark after our five-week excursion into the Bread of Life discourse. Mark 7, 1 through 8, 14 through 15, 21 through 23. Welcome back to Mark, everyone. This is exciting. Exciting. Woohoo. <clears throat> yes. And uh, and here we are in. It's, uh, it's, it is kind of a good news, bad news thing, though. The good news is we're back in Mark. <laughs> the bad news is three weeks in James. Three weeks? No way. I think Five we weeks. have longer. Five weeks. No, I just looked. You know what? I probably, yes, Holy Cross. Uh, tripped me up on the as I was looking at it. Five weeks, yep, in five James. glorious weeks. Like James. I said, good news, bad news. I like James. Oh, I love James. More, I, more I like it. Yep, I, I, know I you really do. like James. Uh, okay, but Mark, uh, just to so we might need to do a little bit of you know reorientation of getting people back into Mark. Remember this gospel. We are uh, in chapter seven. This is Jesus' second major speech, uh, and this. Uh, outline. I think it's helpful just to because we're we're we get dropped into um, these different portions of with whom Jesus is speaking. So verses one through thirteen, he's speaking to the Pharisees and some of the scribes that you get in verse one. Uh, Fourteen through sixteen, uh, the audience changes to the crowds. And then 17 through twenty three, he speaks to his disciples. So, uh, I think before we even like talk about some of the themes here, it's helpful to have the overall picture of of uh, of how this topic of uh, this idea of of in the integration or the connection between uh, what you uh, what you say and what's in your heart uh, is then directed to those three different audiences. That's helpful to know that, that what's going on in terms of how the, the the whole scene is constructed, because like you said, it's it's rare to get extended teaching from Jesus in this gospel. Exactly. It's terribly, it's a terribly important passage to help people avoid misunderstandings around the Pharisees, around the law and Jesus' approach to the law, but especially around questions of purity and what's going on there, which means it's also in very many ways a passage that sometimes triggers a lot of anti-Jewish preaching, mm -hmm. uh, often from preachers who don't realize what they're doing. So just to be aware of that, that it's a passage that I think deserves so would, some time and attention. So how would you correct that, Matt? What would be a couple of homiletical tips we can give our listeners that uh, to prevent that um, kind of direction or kind of preaching or assumption in terms of what's happening in this passage? Well, I'll give a couple rapid fire ones. How about that? Yeah, One is great. not to assume that the Pharisees are, are antagonists of Jesus or are somehow works righteousness kinds of people or that they're villains in some ways. Uh, to recognize the, that verse three is wrong when it says the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands. It's just, the passage itself shows that's not true because Jesus' disciples aren't washing their hands before they eat. I mean, it's well, right, we're, that, we're in the midst of a significant debate here. Yeah, that's go ahead. the well. The, no, that's the important point of recognizing the diversity of audience. Uh, so this is this 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 issue is being directed to all to to everyone, not just. <laughs> You can't single out the the Pharisees and the scribes and and uh, and pigeonhole them uh, into that because you're being addressed as well as one of Jesus' disciples. So that's yeah. yeah. 
Yep. Yeah. And just basically to notice the diversity of Jewish practice in the time and how he's in the midst of, of a long going debate. I think you need to know what's going on between the distinguishing between tradition and commandment. That's part of what's going on in this passage. And then I'll just say one last thing about defilement, that defilement and impurity is not the same thing as sin and sinfulness. Mm -hmm. And that trips up a lot of people. And they assume that when Jesus here is reframing defilement, that he's uh, showing disregard for the law, that he's showing contempt for the law, which appears not to be true based on a larger reading of Mark and the other synoptics. Uh, but as well, you have to understand this notion of, of what defilement is and why it was a big deal, or still is a big deal, but why in particular it was a big deal for uh, his conversation partners here. Mm -hmm. Well, so then spell that out. What, what's defilement? Well, defilement is, you know, basically putting your body into a, a, a state where it's not fit to encounter God. And so as, as you know, Rolf, lots of the Old Testament texts around purity are commands for priests and what they should or shouldn't do to prepare themselves for ministry in the temple. Uh, in the first century, those laws for a lot of Jews had been extended to govern daily life. Uh, but it's not that there's anything wrong with touching a corpse. So there's not that there's anything wrong with uh, a woman's menstrual cycle. There's not that there's anything wrong with the things that happen in ordinary life that from a priestly point of view would render you somehow not fit to approach God in the temple or approach temple worship. And so, but those, that's different from saying that somebody is sinful or has committed sin or something like that. The law expects you to encounter defilement on a regular basis. And the law offers ways in which you would then uh, cleanse yourself. And so for some Pharisees that involved the washing of hands before you put food into your mouth, before you touched your food. Uh, and things like that. So these are these are different things, which makes then verse 21 and 22 very interesting, where Jesus names particular sins and saying, these are the things that actually have power to defile. And these aren't about the things that you touch or the things you encounter or the states of your body in everyday life. These are about things you generate in your own heart <laughs> that that um, are what true defilement looks like. So he's, in some ways, he starts to blur that line about sin and defilement towards the end um, when he describes what you should really all be worried about or what, what we really should be uh, majoring in, so to speak. Yeah, and is there also, maybe not necessarily blurring the lines, but calling attention to, uh, calling attention to, uh, how is it that how is it that one uh, embodies their piety uh, or or obedience? Um, where is that coming from, or what's the motivation for that? Is that part of it too? Do you think or part of what Jesus is redefining here? Yeah, or yeah. This conversation. Yeah. Um, I think partly it's uh -huh. you know it's. Um, he's talking about the way in which, you know, Rolf talked about good news, bad news earlier, right? The, mm -hmm. the good news here is he's saying um, defilement's not as big of a deal as you thought it was. Ritual defilement, because the power of life in Jesus is stronger than those things that, that make for death. That's the good news. The bad news is the problem of evil in the world isn't out there, it's inside of you. And so it's, mm -hmm. some of it has to do with, and the bad news is a lot heavier than the good news, I think, in that regard. So some of it has to do, I think not so much with like motive or intention, but just this idea of, don't you realize um, the, the power of sin in the world and in one's own life? as being the much greater concern. Now, of course, mm -hmm. Jesus has solutions for those types of things as well in, uh, in throughout the gospel. Am I answering your question right or am I answering the wrong question? Yeah, I think, no, I, th I think so. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that Deuteronomy helps us. I mean, I'm not going to Deuteronomy yet, but I think Deuteronomy doesn't help this in terms of 
of uh, the focus on statutes and ordinances and obedience uh, that it kind of it it casts a lens on this passage to say you know whether or not you're whether or not you're following certain ordinances or certain you know or what does a you know what does obedience look like but but this more of when when there is an examination of the heart that that's you know that's where our true obedience lies and that that's what you need to look at and not necessarily what you know cast blame on what's outside um yeah so i think it's complicated but yeah it uh but it it i think you know you when you what, what you pointed out at the end that uh, the ways in which that vice list, right, um, is, is really pointing to uh, the kinds of things that do come from your heart, <laughs> envy and slander and pride and folly, uh, that those are, those, it is those, those things that are indicative of, of uh, to whom you lodge obedience. Um, and if, if those are the things that are coming out of you, then clearly you're not following the Lord. Yeah, and I think that's the implicit criticism here is mm -hmm. um, we can fight about purity ritual, however you want to fight about that, but don't you realize these much more serious things mm -hmm. that, that don't dwell out there, but are mm -hmm. um, corrupting the human person, mm -hmm. each of us? There's, yeah, there's so much to say. One thing I want to say is uh, uh, we do all these things at my house. Uh, we do not eat anything from the market unless we wash it. Uh, my daughter works for the Minnesota Department of Health in the Department of Foodborne uh, Illness Outbreaks. And uh, so she tracks down this stuff. And guess what? She's like, we wash everything. And we read and we write down that we don't write it down actually, but which company it came from so that if we get sick, we know. Wow. And, uh, and we that. wash our cups and I pots wash and kettles. Stuff, but, yeah. yeah. So uh, again, just to, uh, to make sure we're not miss, so we're not trivializing first century Jewish ritual identity. That's the other thing I wanted to say is a big purpose of the law and of keeping um, kosher laws, kashrut, uh, is simply cultural identity. And that when I say simply, I don't mean that it's a small deal. Uh, how do you keep your identity in a world that is the empire is trying to erase your identity so that you will assimilate? Uh, well, one way that uh, the Jewish uh, people have kept their identity is by keeping kosher. Um, I think it was the great rabbi and Bible scholar uh, Heschel, uh, when he came to America, one of the, when he interviewed at General Seminary, I think uh, in uh, New York City, they said, do you keep kosher? And he said, kosher I keep. He, they said, why? He goes, because I do not understand it. Uh, you know, that is that there is a mystery and a, and a identity piece. And so one of the things that's at stake here uh, for folks would be like you're you're inviting us to to erase our identity and so that would be very threatening last thing i wanted to say and i said i'd say two and i've already said two uh, the last thing i want to say though is that as we'll see this is, jesus was not the first one to blur these lines between the categories of uncleanliness and sin uh, deuteronomy does it psalm 15 does it as we'll see Speaking of Psalm 15, let's let's rock Psalm 15. But so, that's that's the connection, verse two, and speak the truth from their heart, who do not slander with their tongue, right? That's the lectionary. No, I think it's bigger than that. And do you? actually it's okay. it's a good connection, actually. I mean, um, so do you want to know my favorite uh, non-trivial, trivial detail about the book of Psalms? And I think I've probably never said this before. Wow. Unless you're just going to roll your eyes like you say it every year. But I don't think I have. So, so Psalm 15 is about who can enter into God's presence, right? That is, uh, the category is what, 
makes you unworthy to be in the presence of God. And so if you read Leviticus, what you would expect is a list of ritual um, or uh, violations and then ritual purif uh, purifications to go through. So here's the question. Who may abide in your tent and who may dwell on your holy hill? Who can come into the presence of God? And what you expect is, like I said, rituals. There's not a single ritual prescribed in the entire book of Psalms, not one. And if you read Leviticus, then what would you expect? There's maybe, there's maybe a couple tangential references to rituals, but they're not prescribed like you get in other texts and in other ancient Near Eastern poetic psalmic texts. So what instead you get here is um, the category of sin. Those who walk blamelessly and do what is right, who speak the truth, who do not slander, who do no evil, who do not take up a reproach, um, who stand by their oath to their own hurt, who do not lend money at interest. I mean, these are not what you would expect at all. And so even in the Old Testament, you're getting a blurring of the lines. And maybe you would say even a dispute within Israelite religion um, mm. about the categories of, of uncleanliness and sinfulness. Mm. Is this the shortest Psalm? Psalm 117 is, I think you asked that last month. Oh, I did? Maybe. I, maybe I always ask it for the short ones. Because I, then I can't remember. Psalm 117 is two verses. Oh, that'd be a great Bible trivia question. Uh, the other thing is, I like it when you say, if you read Leviticus and not when you read Leviticus. <laughs> uh, anyway. All right. Song of Solomon. Here's my question. Are we, we're going to skip over Deuteronomy 4 entirely then? We should probably mention Deuteronomy 4. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. I thought we kind of already talked about that. Uh, well, I would just say didn't. very, very briefly that the reason these debates around law that we see in Mark 7 and elsewhere are so important is to defining Mark of what it means to be Jewish. <clears throat> but of course, it's also viewed as the thing that gives life. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of Christians need to understand, right, that the law is not viewed by Jews as the means by which you earn your salvation. It's viewed by the mean, the way in which God um, the, uh, uh, presents you a way of living that is life affirming in so many ways. And so yeah. Deuteronomy 4 kind of gets that direction, but just something that, that lifts that up so that, again, some of the old tropes can finally be exposed and, and put to put to rest. Um, yeah, which I think That's is worth doing in Mark seven, if you're going to preach on March seven. That's really helpful. That's all I really want to say about this. So again, I'm using Deuteronomy yeah. four to make better sense of Mark seven. Well, that's fine. Verses seven and eight, though, deserve to be highlighted. What other great nation has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is whenever we call on him? And what other great nation has statutes and ordinances as just as this entire law that I'm setting forth for you today? That is, I mean, part, part of it is the justice of the law that um, the first place, if you want to, I hear a lot from pastors these days about justice. If you want to study justice, start by studying Deuteronomy and the Ten Commandments, especially. But those two lines, you know, about what other great nation, obviously it's a rhetorical question anticipating the negative. Pretty much no other great nation has a God who is so near in prayer and so clear in just ordinances. And that, that I, I don't think you can hear this. I'm going to pull a line from Caroline. I mean, you cannot hear this about the justice of the law without fast forwarding to uh, the line later in Deuteronomy, circumcise your hearts, mm. uh, which is again, um, circumcision is not simply then a ritualistic obedience, but it is uh, within Deuteronomy, those lines of between ritual obedience and, and uh, moral obedience are uh, blurred. And so that even way back in Deuteronomy in Psalm 15, you're getting, uh, you're getting this blurring. Mm. Yeah. 
Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon. Okay, is this the only time that Song of Solomon ever occurs in the lectionary? Well, first of all, this is the semi-continuous lectionary, and I'm sure it's Correct. not. Okay. But I do, uh, this is where I have to make my, um, what I now, when I get to Song of Solomon. So this is here because we're in the middle of the Solomon cycle. Yeah. In the semi-continuous. So we, we had uh, the prayer for wisdom. Then we had the temple prayer and the building of the temple was implied. And now uh, I, uh, I haven't looked ahead. I actually passed next week. Uh, but if I do so, you're getting, I'm confused about where I am in the lectionary. Yeah, so here we are. So next week is Proverbs. And then the following week after that is Proverbs and then more Proverbs and then Esther. So they're skipping, uh, they're skipping Ecclesiastes. But so the, I think, I think the rabbinic uh, legend is Solomon wrote Song of Solomon when he was young. Uh, Proverbs when he was middle-aged and Ecclesiastes when he was old. Um, and of course he probably didn't write any of them, but. Um, uh, ah, this all makes sense now. But so the Song, of, Sol song, song of, of Solomon is yeah. of course a love song. Uh, and uh, I like how, I like what the Babylon Bee did to it with their um, saying, hey, what if you took some of these lines from this love song and put them on uh, Valentine's Day candy? So there's, they'd put on the little hearts. Uh, not really, but it's like, Hey, tower neck, you have goat hair. Your <laughs> teeth are sheep. <laughs> so I think it's kind of a funny entry into it just because you, to read this is uh, you're just going to have to get way outside of your own cultural frame of reference. And, and by imagining some of these things, you know, um, my beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag, you know, you, you're a gazelle. I mean, you know, that is uh it gets Thank you. you. That's one of the nicest things you've ever said to me. <laughs> just to be clear, since we're at work, I was not saying that to you. Ornament. Oh. I was just reading verse nine. Oh. The, uh, you could just say, you could just call it, say Dorcas. It's the same exactly. thing. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Dorcas. Gazelle. But this is. I was called in the playground a few times, I think, as a kid. Exactly. <laughs> Dorkmeister. This Poor is. Thing. All that aside, this is such a beautiful <laughs> passage. It is. It um, is. They the, love poems. Yeah, and, and this is one of the two most accessible places. Uh, uh, the other is also about water, interestingly enough, which is many waters cannot quench love, nor can whatever oceans drown it, which is, I, I give my wife a, a piece of pottery with that on it. Um, but here this right arise my love my fair one come away for winter is past the rain is over and gone flowers appear on the earth the time of singing has come you know uh and then more imagery of of the earth producing its its bounty arise my love my fair one and come away I mean, this is a great text um for for weddings uh and as people know this is one of the most disputed books in uh, the canon. It was uh, one of the ones that was most disputed about whether it should get in by the rabbis. And um, it was finally, I think, let in because of it was seen as a parable about the love between God and the people. Yeah. But I think there's something valuable about just reading it as what it is. Mm -hmm. Well, there... oh, go ahead. Sorry. Nope. A celebration no, of human love. Yeah, and isn't there also uh, biblical interpretation or biblical that that it becomes also a, a a way to imagine the relationship between Jesus and the church? Yeah, yeah. So you've got the yeah the between God and God's people and Jesus and the church. But I I think you're right. Like the the way in which um, we don't get it we don't get passages <laughs> very often that that uh, that speak about the the quality of human love and what that looks like and being able to talk about that from the pulpit I think is I think and that, and the line the winter the winter is past I mean um, I have preached this wedding this sermon at second weddings for people who've been through difficult times and mm. that line is just about the winter is past the rain mm. is over and gone 
and mm -hmm. that it is it's recognizing seasons of life that are no fun to go through. Mm. Matt. I was going to make a joke. On. I was going to make a joke, but I think it's out of place now. I kind of want to hear the joke, but uh, I do too. <laughs> I just don't like the whole like parable of Jesus in the church. I don't, I don't like the image of oh. Jesus standing outside my wall and peeking through the windows and stuff like that. So I didn't say I, I liked it. I'm just saying people do that. I just want to say, well, it, it's those, I think those interpretations are partly thought up by people who think that erotic poetry has no place in the Bible. And so that's also exactly. worth exactly digging into a sermon, which I think we're talking about here is why is a path, why is a book like this in scripture? And what does that tell us about what kind of book scripture might be? Yeah, and, and yeah. as you both know, the in the medieval monasteries where they copied and illuminated the Bible, the most the most commented upon book was Song of Songs. Oh, hmm. I did not know that. I don't know if that's a plug for or against the monastic life, but maybe we should talk about James. <laughs> oh my God, can we just talk more about Song of Songs? <laughs> no, we're, we're going to talk about James. I all right, bring it on. Well, okay, so we've got five, uh, five weeks in James now. So this would be, uh, I mean, this would be a a great sermon series. You could start here, uh, especially moving into, and I'm sure we've talked about this before, but especially moving into the program year, which will be a very different kind of program year. I mean, in, in terms of a lot of churches coming back after after the pandemic and. Uh, what would it what would it look like and sound like to uh, to take uh, I'm going to fast forward to James 2 8 which um, which I think is one of the most I mean we get that next week but I for me it's a really helpful uh, lens through which to uh, to view James and to appreciate James you have in our election for today verse 22 but be doers of the word and, but it's 2.8, you do well if you rely, if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so that, that, that doers of the word of fulfilling of the fulfilling of the law through love, that, 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 that this, the doing of the word is for the sake of loving your neighbor. Uh, and it's for the sake of, uh, of, of, um, what does it what does it really mean to have faith uh, and what that looks like so that's my first comment yeah it's a particular kind of theological discourse right it's the the mm -hmm. book doesn't proceed the way paul does or hebrews does or some of the other general letters that we find in the new testament it's it understands theology as not something to be talked about or, or to be Kind of laid out as much as it is to be lived out and so it's this very participatory book and there are occasional theological statements that are really important but this this opens it up really neatly in the ways that you talked about that james can't under understand something being more than one thing right it's so you know a a, a clear a, a fresh spring can't give forth bad water um and this idea of you know the Doers of the words like people who look at themselves in the mirror and then they forget who they were or something like that. It's this idea of, the of word. yeah, double mindedness that that drives James crazy. So it's, but like you said, it's always on behalf of the neighbor and it's always um, on behalf of a community. I've been really helped by Margaret Amer's work on James. She's got a book called James. Subtitle is Diaspora Rhetoric of a Friend of God who. Mm who takes really, she takes really seriously the opening verses of James talking about a dispersed community um, and takes that more literally than metaphorically as a community that that is under threat, will never be part of the dominant culture and has to find a way to live out its distinctive identity without fully assimilating, but also without staying so distinct that they become, that they remain an object of distrust or violence from others. And so this idea of how do you live out the gospel in that kind of, of, of volatile or, or dangerous environment? And it's very much through the love that you show to, uh, to others and how that gets lived out. So it's, I think you need to know something about who it's written to 
even though we don't get a lot of clues for that. But of course, part of it is James is very concerned about the poor being mm -hmm. uh, taken advantage of by the church. And he's worried about yeah. the church falling victim to showing preference to the wealthy and the powerful. That's just like one of the driving concerns. Um, Luke Timothy Johnson's got great commentary on this and New mm -hmm. Interpreter's Bible. Uh, Elsa Thomas has a great book on James. So if you're new I to James or scared of James, give it a shot. I think you could summarize James thusly. Theology is a verb, not a noun. <laughs>